Okay, so now we know how you got involved in true crimes. So there you are now, you're an adult, you're dealing with everything, things are going pretty well for you in life. And then you end up being abused again by a partner. Right, so just when I'm getting over and start handling uh, the abuse I deal with my dad, at 19, I get married. So that story is complicated in itself. I transferred from a, a private school to a public school, end up meeting two girls. One becomes the mother of my oldest daughter. Um, they end up fighting over me. So one has my daughter, and then I end up marrying the other one. 19-year-old, you know, I think I'm the ladies' man, hair full of everything. And one day after we dated for a while, she says, we were meant to get married. And as dumb as this sound, I can't remember the name of the movie, but there was a movie at the time that they, I think Tom Hanks was in it. They were connected by their belly navels or something like that. And she said, we're meant to be because of our birthdays. You were born November 1st of 72. I was born October 1st of 72. So it was meant. As dumb as I was at 19, I said, yeah, that's it. Let's get married. Now understand my whole mind frame because of the abuse that I went through was I wanted to get married because I wanted to prove that a man and a woman can exist without having any type of an abuse and can make it for the end of time. So me, we get married, but my mother sits on the front pew of the church that we're getting married in and she is crying like she's at a funeral. And so at the end of the, the ceremony, I walked to my mom, I'm like, what's going on, man? You were crying when we buried your best friend and you feeling okay. And she goes, son, I'm sorry, but I'm crying because this is not going to work out. I don't see this working out for you. Um, she goes, I know you're grown and everything, but I've never steered you wrong. I just don't see it working out. Sure enough, this marriage lasts under a year. Uh, wow. I'm, I'm a professional musician. So I was in a band at the time. We had a tour that was out in Canada. I had let my best friend at the time stay at my house because of the fact that he was homeless. Mm -hmm. uh, and I called from the road. Now, the way my house is set up, I know exactly how long it takes to get from one room to the other. And especially if she's asleep, it takes you a couple extra seconds. So when he answers the phone, I'm like, where's she at? Oh, she's asleep in bed. Uh, literally, I'm on the phone from Canada. Two seconds later, she's on the phone. And I'm like, where are you and where was he? Oh, he was in the living room. Okay, that's at least a 30-second walk, and you were sleeping. And so uh, I kind of felt like something was going on, put out my mind, got home from the tour. Sure enough, I find the condom in between our bed. Ugh. We weren't using anything at the time because we were trying to have a child. And I just didn't yell, didn't scream. I was like, what's this? And everything flew off the handle from that. She starts yelling that I'm accusing her of stuff. Um, I got hit in the head with a frying pan, end up getting locked outside of my house um, in the middle, dead middle of winter in Minnesota, uh -huh. at least a negative six wind chill a negative 22 or negative six degrees, another negative 20 or 22 wind chill. Uh -huh. And uh, I'm outside locked out. And I could have seen this coming previously because there was an altercation before and I went to leave. The one thing that I did take from my therapy is, hey, when you get angry, leave the situation mm -hmm. and my mom was happened to be visiting and she stood in front of the door and my mom was just like are you a fool if the boy wants to leave let him leave do you see how big he is and she's like i'd rather have him hit me than to leave and so after getting hit in the head with that i found out because our house is only stocked with tuna fish and rice and things of that nature, macaroni which to this day i can't stand tuna fish i mean i've had a tuna fish sandwich like in the last couple of years but and that's something I keep in my house all the time. We were both making a lot of money. Even to be 19 and 19 years old, both of us was, she worked at a high powered bank because her mom worked there for years. Mm -hmm. I worked at JC Penny. I'm like, what's up with this? Well, her mom was telling her, you never know what men's gonna do. You need to take all this money and hide it from him and stash it. So she's sitting over here hanging on to all the money. I'm paying all the bills and don't know why we can't afford it. Even thing else besides macaroni and cheese. And so from that, is when I found out exactly how domestic abusers looked upon a man in a marriage situation because, of course, the cops got called. And when the cops came out, they meet me outside, and I'm telling them the whole story. I'm like, dude, I'm about to get frostbit. My toes are frozen. Here's what went down. And the cops laughed at me. After they saw her, you know, about a five-foot-something heavyset white girl just standing there, they looked at her and looked at me like, you trying to tell me that she's beating you. I'm like, dude, the thing is, is a frying pan will level anybody if you hit them right. And mm -hmm. I said, she uses my past against me. And that's the one thing that some women do 
mm-hmm. and why men don't speak out because the past when they found out we've been abused comes out and they use that. And that's what she used because she knew I wouldn't hit her back. I can't say that if I didn't go through the, through the abuse I did and seen the way my mom was treated, that might've been a whole different situation, right? Mm-hmm. Because I have no idea of what that's like, but she knew I would never hit her. Mm-hmm. And she teed off on me. I've, I was hitting the stomach. I've been hitting the chest. I've been poked. Um, her parent, her mom and sister came over like, I'm the one that's beating people up. And I, and I did say, I say, look at her and look at me. If I was to hit her, especially with the martial arts training that I have, mm-hmm. I would love her. There would be no question that I beat her up. And I was like, dude, so the cops like, well, uh, we're going to take you to jail. But if we take you to jail, we got to take everybody. I'm like, well, let's go. I'm ready. To, I'm like, I'm the one with the bruises, dude. She has nothing. Mm-hmm. And of course, she didn't want to go to jail. She's like, no, that's all right. Mm-hmm. I don't want to go. Um, and that kind of messed with my mind. You know, I've been married a total of five times. And a lot of that is because of the fact that I wanted to get this right. And I felt like that I was always the one that was losing. And I still had that hope. My problem was I jumped from one to the next to the next. And I will admit that my second marriage is because to protect my sons, because Minnesota is a woman and children state. And since we were both teenagers, she got all the rights. Men, there's just sperm donors and bank accounts. And mm. so when I found out that I have more rights if I'm married, the moment that I was told that I was about to have a son, I'm like, we get married. And I didn't mm-hmm. expect that one to to last because, yeah, technically it was false pretense because I just wanted to make sure I was there for my son. Yeah. So now which which marriage was that? Your... So that was marriage number one. Okay. Marriage wow. number two produced my sons. <laughs> to okay. Bit. But I thought you said you had a daughter. I do. So my daughter was from a girl. Uh, her and my first wife was the ones fighting over me. Oh. And so uh, we had a relationship briefly, you know, it was one of those things, teenagers, especially men, we full of ego and, you know, this ain't going to happen. And, you know, I, I was smelling myself because I got all these girls over me. Mm-hmm. And uh, one day the sex situation came up and I, I remember the back of my head. First thing he said is I better not get pregnant. You know, what does all do say? Oh, baby, you're going to get pregnant. Sure <laughs> enough. <laughs> she got pregnant um, and we found that out. Uh, right. And Kim and I had got married sometime after that. But so she knew that my daughter existed. It was coming in the whole nine. So, yeah, she's the one I did my first podcast with. She's my oldest daughter. She's 30 now. So, yeah. Oh, wow. OK, great. So how many children do you have? I have a total of six children, seven grandbabies. Oh, my goodness. Congratulations. Thank you. Out of that mix, I have uh, six grandsons and one granddaughter. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So I'm really curious now. All right, because um, you have six grandsons. Mm-hmm. I, I'm I'm just really curious about like your relationship with them because I know you love them to death, and they're the you know, and of course, your granddaughter is too. But as a grandfather and everything that you had gone through, um, are you very protective of them? Do you try and you know, in a gentle way, try and educate them about, you know, relationships or anything like that? Or do you just sit back and and pray? I sit back and pray a lot because uh, a lot of my grandkids is caught up in the whole um, a divorce situation right now. Oh. Uh, like my middle son has two of my grandsons and she's playing the game where I don't like you. I don't like your family. I want to keep them apart. I have the most talk, uh, the most dealing with my granddaughter. Uh, my oldest daughter has a total of three kids. Two of those are boys. Uh, but she did the right thing when she was younger and ended up having to give them up. Mm-hmm. And she talks a lot about that on her own journey. But the cool thing was the person that has them, she's able to see, they know that she's mom. So there's still a relationship there with them. Oh, um, how lovely. So I do have the most with uh, her children. But yeah, I pray a lot. You know, my granddaughter's coming up and, you know, always, you know, when she talks to me, she loves grandpa. (laughs) And so, yeah, you know, at at the young age that she is four or five now, you know, I I try to tell her, you know, hey, you know, when you go to school, those young boys ain't nothing. You know, you worthy of more than what they don't give out. So don't get caught up at a young age. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Well, of course she loves you. What's not to love? Oh, thank you. (laughs) And so that brings me to another question because she is so young. And yours, you know, watch out for those boys. When she starts to get a little bit older, um, are you going to get her enrolled in Taekwondo? Yes, I told her mom to put on some type of, of martial arts. 
I thoroughly believe in martial arts from a young age just because of the calming. A lot of parents don't have a lot of the issues that parents have with kids and obedience, things of that nature. And it's something to keep you grounded, right? You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's not about the fight and the physical. Mm -hmm. It's made for me, it's more about keeping you grounded and solid in something. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I do recommend that. And the discipline and the self-respect and right. the respect for others as well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't start at a young age. Well, yes, I did. I started my training at the tender young age of 47. So um, yeah, it changed my life forever. We don't look a day over 20. <laughs> Thank you so I, much. I, I read it's all about, about the lighting. That... <laughs> I know I read something about you that you wrote a book about things that you're doing after 50. And I look, I'm like, wow, she's 50. I'm 50. I'm like, I hope I look half as good as she does. So, <laughs> well, thank you. I'm not 50. 50 was a while back. <laughs> oh, okay. So, see, even better. Yeah. Yeah. So, I'm, I'm a proud baby boomer and I don't care who knows it. So, it's <laughs> really, it's really strange to be, you know, at this point in my life. Uh, it, it's just really weird because I don't feel my age, although I don't know what you know, this age is supposed to feel like I've never been this age before. So I'm doing it my way. <laughs> this is all we can do. Absolutely. Okay. So I have a few things. Um, you already kind of touched on why people who do experience domestic abuse feel so alone and isolated. And the, the fact that domestic abuse does happen to men. Is there, do you think, is there an element of shame wrapped up in both of that the reason why you are isolated or you feel so alone and of course as a, a man trying to what you went through trying to explain to the police no you're not the one that's hitting on your wife she's the one that's hitting on you oh yeah um for one is i think a lot of it is just the way that men are raised mm -hmm. if you look at any uh any society and culture especially when you come to the african-american and hispanic culture mm -hmm. uh the men there we're we're raised to be strong and you don't really want to show your emotion and you got all these women around and my mom was the opposite. She's like, Hey, it's okay to cry. Mm -hmm. Um, but still, you know, when my, like when my mom passed, one of my daughters came to me and said, man, if this was my mom, I would have been boohooing, but you look so historic. I'm like, you have no idea what I've been through for the two weeks before you came, but because that's been engraved, you know, I had all these women that's crying around me. I need to take care of them first before. And so when a man has to come and admit that they're getting beat, especially by a woman, yeah. it becomes a thing of maybe they think people will view them as weak mm -hmm. um, because of that. It's better to come and say, man, I got beat up by a dude. Well, that's another guy. Mm -hmm. So they don't say anything because mm -hmm. for one, they feel like that they're weak. Machismo mm -hmm. kicks in. And then it's like, well, who the hell is going to believe me anyway when they look at me and her? And right. it's even worse in my situation because uh, I was in, in a racial relationship. So mm. automatically, depending on the cops that come out, I'm looked at completely different just because of my skin tone at that point. Wow. It's when I, my husband and I were, were just dating and we hadn't been dating for very long and he's six foot four. And he came uh, to my apartment one evening and he was so rattled. He was so upset. He had after his um, baseball game, he and his buddies went drinking, you know, one of the local bars and three women accosted him all at the same time. I mean, one just, you know, went behind him and, you know, grabbed him, turned him, his head and kissed him right on the lips. One woman actually, you know, reached down, you know, into his pants. I mean, it was just like, and and he was telling me this and he was still visibly upset. And the women said to him, you are coming with us. And he's like, look, there's a lot of these guys around here. He would be happy to go home with you or do whatever you want. And his friends are sitting there going, yeah, pick me, pick me. <laughs> and they said, no, we want you. And it really rattled him. And finally I said, well, why didn't you say something to the bouncer? And he said, are you kidding me? A six foot four man going to say that these women are, you know, hitting on me or picking on me. He said they would laugh me right out of the bar. And that's a lot of reasons why men who are sexually abused, because the problem that was about my first marriage, I was sexually abused by her too as well. Oh. Um, because the fact that she wanted to get back together, people was like, why did you even go? And I went to her van and she goes, I just want to talk. And uh, she locked me in the van and because she knew I wouldn't beat her or whatever, you know, uh, I was wearing very loose sweats that day. Things came down and before I could say anything, mouth went on pieces and that was it. And the thing about it is, is people are like, well, how can you be sexually abused? Here's, here's the main reason why no one's going to believe us because there is a stigma that men want sex all the time. And if a woman was to come up to you and offer it to you, you just going to take it and you're not going to feel violated. But if you reverse that whole scenario you just said, 
and it was him that did that to the woman, mm-hmm. oh, he would have been bounced, beat up, the cops would have been called because it's more believable. But mm-hmm. we don't want to be groped on and grabbed on either. That's still sexual harassment to us, especially if we don't know you and we're married. You know, that's right. disrespectful to our wife. Even if you're not with us, a man who's happily married will tell you, I react the way that I would, even if my wife was standing here with me. Right. So he already felt violated, but he's right. Yeah. He couldn't say anything about that because they can look at him like, man, you a fool. Now, they, these three women want to go home and sleep with you. Every man mm-hmm. don't want that. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, that's, I find that fascinating because, you know, we are, as women, we're finally not, we're encouraged to say no and no means no. But you don't get that same kind of respect or that same kind of, uh, you know, personal dignity that you can say no. I'll give you a good example of somebody that everybody knows. When the whole Me Too movement went on and, and um, Weinstein, right, was found out, big dude Terry Crews came out and he told you that Harry Weinstein, Harvey Weinstein grabbed him by his junk at one point in time, that he wanted to smash him, but he would be looked at as thou the angry black man in blacklisted. Now, this is a huge dude. I can't tell you the replies. Oh, yeah, like Terry Crews going to let this happen to him. Like he wouldn't knock him out. See, this is the stigma part of that. Why he's telling you, yes, I was sexually harassed by this man. Here's the reason, though, I couldn't say anything. Yet you still ridicule him for that. His whole career would have been over. And he's absolutely right. We carry the stigma as African-American men that we always angry. And all we want to do is argue, fuss and fight. And as big as Terry Crews is, probably one hit would have knocked Harvey on his butt. Well, but, I think personally that's what Harvey would have um, needed, but <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't have worked well for Terry. So, okay, so we got that. And uh, let me see. Why are you passionate about helping other people with their podcasts? Because over almost five years, I've listened to every YouTube video. I've listened to some bad advice. I've probably done everything that people who want to start a podcast have done, but I've done it wrong. Mm-hmm. And when I started True Crime and Authors, uh, now I knew how to do everything right. So mm-hmm. like, for instance, a streaming, every streaming service that you can think of, I've already tested out. And I tell people, this is the one to go with if you're doing remote interviews. I tell mm-hmm. people why Zoom is not, necessarily the number one go-to because it's how constructed um the number one thing i always heard that cringed me was they would tell people you can start a podcast right now right on your phone and my wife always laughs i'm like well unless you really have to you can drive a car with your feet too doesn't mean it's a good (laughs) idea and what (laughs) those things are saying is they're not preparing you for the long haul because everybody i know that got into podcast they became addicted to and they loved it Mm -hmm. So then the question is, if you did shoot that episode on your phone, now it doesn't sound as crisp as everything else. When you go get better equipment, what are you going to do with that? So Mm -hmm. that's why I'm passing to let people know. And of course, it's all my opinion, but the pitfalls I've already failed through. If I can help you not make those when you starting out or even now, uh, things that can be corrected if you've been podcasting for a while, Mm -hmm. I would like to do that. And that's why I'm passionate about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, Now, what are the statistics? Is it how many new podcasters, um, I don't know exactly what the stats are, typically just give up after about 30 episodes? So actually the number is as low as seven. So they call seven the holy grail. So they're like, if you make it past your seventh episode, you may be sticking around for a long period of time. Um, now, Jesse Gee, they ain't always true. My other podcast, and my daughter kind of fills it out on me because she had other things. We had over 135 episodes in over four years. But it wasn't for the lack of not wanting to do it. But what ends up happening is people get into podcasting that then they're going to get rich right away. Yeah. They don't make the money. Monetization takes time. So then about the seventh episode in, they're like, I'm not getting the 400 million you know, subscribers I wanted, so I'm out. So there's a lot of dormant podcasts that if you go and just take a look, they hit seven, maybe 10 episodes, and you don't see mm-hmm. anything else. So seven is actually the magical number for podcasts to fail. Well, I feel pretty good about that then because I'm, what am I now? I think you're number 239, I think so. And I did not come into podcasting willingly. It was a long story. It happened to, there was a lady in um, radio here in Denver who was starting a a a platform with only female podcasters and blah, 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 long story. And she was looking for female podcasters. 
and she, um, you know, was having this contest. So you could join this contest, enter this contest um, to become the next best female podcaster. And I thought, huh, if I enter this, this contest, I could learn. I have no idea what a podcast is. I might learn something about podcasting. I might be able to meet this woman. So why not? I'll enter the contest. So eight weeks, miserable weeks later, I was invited to join the, the platform. I, of course, did not win the contest. And so that's how it all began. And I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> sometimes I look back I, I don't listen to the early um episodes because when I tried to it was like almost cringeworthy and my ears were bleeding so oh my goodness if you go back and listen to any of the early first season of Dave Crime I look I'm like man this is horrible because the way the long way I've come but I didn't get into podcasting willingly either so uh, truth be told my daughter came to me and said dad what we love true crime when we started a true crime podcast I had just did 14 years on YouTube. So there's a channel called Cena's Corner. I was big into the rhythm game, rhythm uh -huh. gaming industry. And I'm like, man, that's a whole different skill set. It takes different things. And she's like, well, we let's come on, let's let's just do it. Um, and so I'm like, fine. So I learned how to edit, which you know is a whole different beast and all of that kind of stuff. And then it stuck, right? Because I'm like, well, when, when she decided she couldn't do it anymore, I'm like, I really like podcasting because I get to put things out in the world. What can I do? So True Crime and Authors came out September last year. Uh, mm -hmm. We're already like on the 25th episode. Um, but then what really kept me going is this, and I give this encouragement to your audience if you're looking at doing a podcast. There's a couple of things we didn't know. So we were, um, we made history twice. Once because we were the first ever father-daughter true crime podcasting team. Then we come to find out that we were the first father-daughter team in any podcasting genre wow. and then because of that we were the first african-american uh father order teams we broke that we got asked to speak to podcast movement in uh 2020 which was the biggest which is the biggest podcast convention mm -hmm. uh and then spreaker picked us up uh mm -hmm. which i'm still with them now they came and said hey we're just gonna give you all of this space and stuff because we believe in your podcast so mm -hmm. things can't happen if you just put it out there mm -hmm. and if you're consistent right consistency is the big key yeah, you can't give up. I can see how that mother, uh, that father daughter team would be unique. Yeah, it had a good vibe because especially with our age different, uh, we mm -hmm. both see things a little bit differently, mm -hmm. and and that really works for the older crowd and the younger crowd uh, because you're like, well, how does a young person feel about it? Well, you're getting that, mm -hmm. um, and then the research was fun because there's a couple things that we would always research the same case, but we always tried to give people something that they didn't know before. And I've mm -hmm. even stumped her. So if you listen to the Trayvon Martin case, it's really funny that we did because the fact that she had no idea the information I found out on the gun that Zimmerman used. Uh -huh. And you can hear it in her voice. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's so funny. Well, it has been, David, it has been an honor to have you on the show. I just love talking to you. I could, we could be here all day, but I really have something to do in another hour or so. Um, but it's been wonderful talking to you. Thank you so much for being on the show and sharing your story. Thanks, Joe, for having me. I appreciate it. And it's been my honor and pleasure to be here today. Before we sign off, I do want you to uh, give a couple of your links uh, to the audience. Of course, it's going to be in the show notes, but I really like for the guests to have the opportunity to articulate um, some of your, um, your, your social media, your website, how they can find you, um, how they can contact you if they would like. So if you can just share with that. to the Sure. Audience. So you can find my website at truecrimeandauthors.com. Uh, also, my email is the same, truecommonauthors at gmail.com. Uh, I am on um, Twitter under True Crime Authors. I'm on uh, Spotify. I'm on Instagram. Uh, I'm sure all those will be linked down. You can also find them on my website. They're all listed right there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, also, if you want to come on the show, I just started a third segment of my show called Extraordinary People. So people like myself that's been through some things here at my audience, there's a link at the top. Just go ahead and fill out my calendar and make your way over. Excellent. Wonderful. I already started following you on Twitter and Instagram. And I think there was another one. I can't remember, but TikTok so. probably. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not on TikTok, but I did. see that. <laughs> that was my slowest one right now. So, okay. So before we sign off, is there one final pearl of wisdom you want to leave the audience with? Yeah. If you're a man out there that went through this, speak up. I'm hoping that I'm giving you the voice to do that. You're not by yourself. 
the quicker that you talk about these things, the healing will come and you will feel better for doing so. And you're also helping somebody else that may, that you may know or not even know at the mm -hmm. same time. Perfect. And thank you for saying that and reiterating it for the guys out there. Um, because I, I really think that society has, has made a way of taking their voice away and mi minimizing and marginalizing their experience. So I really appreciate you being here and sharing your story and giving other men the courage to be able to stand up and say no. Well, thank you for having me on, having the courage to have me here. It's been great. Okay. And everybody, thank you so much for listening. Do check out David's um, podcast, check out the website, uh, check out his social media. He does have some very interesting YouTube videos out there. I did check those out. Um, and remember that men can be abused as well. And just to be kind and gentle and supportive, because I think that men get a really bad rap sometimes, and that's just not right. So that is the way of the Femininja.